When you understand this principle, you can see why you can partake of our nature and yet never harbor a wrong thought or even hate the things that we're tempted with. So then you say, well, that means he's not different. He's different in character, not in nature. His battle was greater than ours would ever be in this area of self, much greater than ours. So great that the whole plan of salvation was at stake. You know, we're told in inspiration that um, when Christ assumed humanity, it was through an infinite cost. We can understand that because he's, he bears our humanity for eternity. But it also says Christ through an infinite cost and a painful process assumed humanity. And that's, that statement always, um, I want to know what she meant by a painful process. Certainly, you know, stepping down from heaven and from the divine uh, things of heaven to become a human being, of course, that's a great cost. But let's say, for example, he stepped down to the level of unfallen Adam. There's nothing painful about it. Yes, it's a condescension, it's a humiliation, but I don't see it painful. She says a painful process. And this study, we're going to see why. You see, when he assumed humanity, friends, he partook of an element or a principle in his nature, in his mind, that never existed before in a holy being, in an unfallen being. We can't comprehend that because we're, this is our lot from the moment we're born. But he came from heaven in the presence of unfallen beings and he being the holy son of God. And now in, in his mind and in his nature, there is an element where self wants to govern, where self wants to strive for mastery. He had to fight with that. And we're going to see that in the study today. And that's why I believe it was a painful process. This is also a very controversial topic, it always has been, uh, in Christology among all, all churches, particularly Adventist church. And basically for a long time, there's been two views, pre-fall or post-fall, or that's some theological terms, they say post prelapsarian or post-lapsarian. In other words, did Christ take the nature of Adam before he fell or after he fell? I think that one's pretty obvious. I actually don't understand, I cannot believe how anyone, let alone theologians, can teach that Christ took the nature of Adam before the fall. Nonetheless, that's a very popular teaching. But more recently, the last years, there's been a more refined one and it's a hybrid type of Christ whereas yes they agree he took our our nature our fallen nature but his mind was different and you see friends when you cut Christ's mind off from all humanity now mind different in the fact that of course that he never sinned that he har never harbored an evil thought we'll see that absolutely no one's going to dis no one's going to dis disagree with that but they say different in the sense that he did not have in his mind, in his nature, that element that I'm referring to earlier, which is self, selfishness wanting to gain the ascendancy or to rule or to put self before God's will. This, this, this sort of thing that we battle with. You take his mind off, friends. You cut him off from humanity. It's just another form of the Immaculate Conception, which is what it's, the Immaculate Conception is designed to do. Through Mary, you cut Christ off from the rest of humanity, and that came about because of original sin teaching. It's no different today. So you remove Christ's mind from this concept, you remove him from all humanity. The ironic thing today is that Adventists who you know, confess to be good Bible students, and yet, and they rightly call the papacy the man of sin, they call it the Antichrist, which showed up through prophecy and Bible prophecy, etc. Adventists rightly call people out of Babylon or out of the papacy. And yet, they believe and teach the Trinity. They believe and teach original sin. They teach heliocentrism and immaculate conception, all the doctrines of the papacy. How can you call people out of the papacy when you're teaching her very doctrines? Anyway, the study today, we're going to look at it Probably one of the main objections you have with the human nature of Christ that we believe in, of course, the fallen nature of Adam, physical, mental, and morally, not just physical. And some people say, well, if Christ took our fallen nature, just like us, 
Why didn't he sin? Why didn't he lust? Why didn't he lose his temper? Why, doesn't, why didn't he do even once the things we do? This is the objection. And this is, we need to understand what's behind sin. Then we can, we'll answer that in, this, in the study today. But friends, even if you cannot explain something fully to your satisfaction, because there are many things that we don't understand that if we're faithful one day, God will show us in heaven. But for example, the incarnation. Who can explain the incarnation? Divinity blending with humanity. What about the sin in heaven? When Lucifer fell in heaven, who can explain that? Now you think about it. A perfect heaven, a perfect being, the, the one who stood at the right side of the right hand of God, the light bearer. Perfect heaven, a perfect being. Everything's per- How do you get sin out of perfection? Explain that. No wonder it's called the mystery of iniquity. No wonder the incarnation is called the mystery of You can't explain these things, but we, we accept them. Everyone accepts that. So just because we can't explain something, it doesn't mean that you've got to invent some other teaching just to satisfy your your understanding. I mean, the Bible teaches plainly that sin is a transgression of the law. We believe it. It teaches that Christ partook of our sinful nature. We'll see that very clearly today. And the Bible also teaches that he never sinned in that nature. But we should accept that for what it says. And when you do, incidentally, it'll take you deeper and you'll see some deeper things that you weren't aware of before because now you're searching. In Revelation 3.21, Jesus says these words, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Notice the next few words. Even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in, in his throne. Just from this re- verse alone, can we in any way see that his overcoming is different to ours? What's even as I also overcame me? Also, do you think that we're going to be in heaven if we don't overcome? Of course not. It says it here. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. And that overcoming has to be the same as, even as I also overcame. So straight off we see that to be in heaven, to sit with Christ on his throne, we need to overcome. And our overcoming is no different to Christ. And do you think you're going to overcome if you believe he had a different nature to you? Again, you're going totally contrary to what the verse is saying. And you can see why now it's important. It begins to become important because Christ is admonishing us here that we need to overcome even as he also overcame. And then we'll be able to sit with him on his throne. That word overcometh there, or overcome, it means to conquer, to subdue, to battle. That's what it means. Christ had to battle, friends. There was something he had to subdue, subdue. And it wasn't so much Satan and his demons, just like it is with us. It begins in the mind. That element I was referring to earlier, there was something he had to subdue and conquer. Inspiration tells us what it is, what the battle was. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God requires a struggle. But the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. This is the battle for every fallen human being. For unfallen beings, this is not a battle, this is a joy. It's a joy, it's a love. That's all they can do. That's all they desire to do, is to serve God and praise Him. But for a fallen being, it's a battle, friends. Surrendering all to the will of God continually because there's some element in there that is wants to protect self. Did Jesus have to fight this battle? The Son of God in His humanity. We're going to look at quite a bit of Spirit of Prophecy today and the Bible. And the reason for that is... I've we could do this study simply just from the Bible, which I'd prefer actually, but it's inspiration that they use, or spirit of prophecy that they use to try and teach that Christ had a different nature to us. So this is why I'm going to see some of these statements and how plain they are. Similar with the Trinity, when they try to use spirit of prophecy to teach the Trinity. Did Christ have to fight, fight this same battle? The Son of God in his humanity wrestled with the very same fierce, apparently overwhelming temptations that assail men. And now she's going to list some of them. Temptations to indulgence to appetite. Who would have thought that? Inspiration just told you, friends. To presumptuous venturing where God has not led them. Presumption is a a sin that we can fall to quite more often than we think. 
and to the worship of the God of this world, which means certainly, which means to sacrifice an eternity of bliss for what? The fascinating pleasures of this life. This statement here is in reference to the wilderness temptation, where Christ was tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He was tempted in those three areas: to turn the stones to bread, to cast himself down from the temple, to you know the pride of life, to prove that his father would would protect him. And when all the kingdoms were passed before him, we in the previous study we went into this a lot more, but I'm just touching on it now. But here we see clearly he had to wrestle with these things. So it even says apparently overwhelming temptations at times that assail men just like us. And brethren want to say he, was, he had a different mind. Where do these temptations take place? Again, he was made like, made like unto his brethren with the same susceptibilities. Mental and physical, not just physical, friends, mental and physical. And Hebrews 4.15, he was tempted in all points like as we are. The Bible goes out of its way to make it clear regarding Christ's life on inhumanity. Tempted with the same in all points just like as we are. This word susceptibilities, it means the weakness, the vulnerability or the liability. And like I said, mental and physical, as it says there. Christ in his mind, not just physically, not just that he tired and he hungered and he thirsted, but even mentally, his mind was weak, friends. It was vulnerable. Now don't misunderstand me. Don't switch off halfway through this presentation and think what's Bill saying. It'll become clearer and clearer what I'm saying. But it's telling you here that he, he had to deal with the same susceptibilities, mental and physical. And that, notice what, what um, she's quoting from Hebrews 4.15. Look what that word what that word means in Hebrews 4.15. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched. This is exactly what the Spirit of Prophecy just told us. With the feelings of our infirmities. But was in all points tempted like as we are. Yet without sin. So even though you have these feelings of infirmities. Even though you have this weakness. That doesn't constitute sin like many want to teach. You don't have to change his nature. That word infirmities. Is what it means. Want of strength. Weakness, infirmity of the body, notice that, or mind, frailty, etc. Christ was touched with these friends' things, not just physically, as I said, but in the mind, especially we'll see at Gethsemane in the mind. The want of strength and weakness and infirmity. You can't tempt divinity with these things. Again, notice this, five testimonies. He knows, Christ knows, he knows from experience. How strong are the inclinations of the natural heart? And that's why he will help in every time of temptation. That's why. Because he knows, friends, from experience. See where it says the natural heart? It's talking about the ungenerate heart. You know, like it says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither does he understand them, for they foolishness unto him. The natural man, the natural heart. Christ knows how strong are those inclinations. And they're obviously the negative ones, they're not good ones, because he, he knows how to help us in every time of temptation. And the Bible says, Romans 1 3, Paul writes some of the strongest things in regard to the human nature of Christ. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David. Now, that was, you'd think would be enough. If he's made of the seed of David, the genealogy of David, his generations, his posterity, then clearly he has the same nature of David. But just to make sure, the apostle adds, according to the flesh. This word flesh is very important. This is what it means. Sarks, the numbers 4561, that's what it means. It can mean your flesh, it can mean the body, the meat of an animal sacrifices, of course. But in the context of the humanity of Christ, or in the context of the flesh warring against the spirit, which we're going to see. This is what it means, friends. Human nature with its frailties. Notice that again, physically and or morally, just like Hebrews 4.15, in touch with the feelings of our infirmities, body or mind. So human nature with its weakness, its frailties, physically, morally, its passions. Especially a human being such is carnally minded or carnal and fleshly. Friends, we know what this means. We deal with it all the time. 
Inspiration tells you, we just read, that Christ was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, according to Sarks, and that's what Sarks means. Uh, pretty clear. Jesus' friends had a fallen nature, a fallen sinful nature. The Bible uses this word in the New Testament 147 times. Paul uses it 22 times, just in Romans. Almost that much again in Galatians. And Romans and Galatians are very similar when it talks about the war of the body, with the spirit, with the flesh, etc. In fact, he uses it 14 times, just in chapter 8, this word. Notice chapter 8. This is where this word sarks is used in regards to the flesh. And you'll see clearly the context, what it means. We saw it from the concordance. Carnal, carnally minded, frailties of human nature, it's passions. Notice how it's used. Sometimes the best concordance is the Bible itself. Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Obviously, we can see there that walking after the flesh means walking after the carnal desires of the heart, the fallen nature, the selfish nature. It's just contrast that we're walking after the spirit. Verse 3, this is the most important verse in the whole Bible on this topic. We're going to look at it a lot more later. What the law could not do in that it was weak for the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, Condemn sin in the flesh. Every time this word is used here, it sucks. Verse 4, the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us. We walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So again, again, you see flesh there is contrast to the spirit. It's the selfish nature of man. For they that are after the flesh, and notice these words, after the flesh, walking in the flesh, walking after the flesh. The flesh of itself is not sin, for instance, inspiration tells us that. It's not, in fact, the flesh of itself cannot act contrary to the will of God. That's a word-by-word -word quote from the Spirit of Christ. It's the will that governs, not the flesh. This is why Christ could partake of that and never be a sinner. In fact, hate those very things we do. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That word carnally there is sarks, same word. It's translated as flesh, as carnally, as carnal. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, notice this, it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be, there will never be. This part of, I was going to say anatomy, but this is the spiritual part, that this part of man's nature, friends, will never be subject to the law of God. It's contrary to it. And neither indeed can be. This is important to remember. And again, verse 13, if we live after the flesh, we shall die. If we go to our grave living after the flesh, which means living in sin, following the cravings of the flesh, which leads you to sin. You're going to die, friends, and talking about here, it's talking about eternally, not just mortally. But if we, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Notice just in these verses, you see this contrast going on, like a battle. Either carnally minded to be death or spiritually minded to be life and peace. Live after the flesh, you're going to die. But if you mortify for the Spirit, you're going to live over and over again. And especially verse 3 about Jesus. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh, but he condemned that sin in his flesh. So I'm just showing you this because we saw the meaning of sarks, and now I'm showing you how it's used, so no one can get it wrong. And it's actually used 13 times, this word, just for Jesus. The word sarks, flesh, 13 times. These are some of them. I didn't bother quoting them, but there they are, Romans 1, 3, 8, 3, etc., you can go through all those. Some of those are very important, actually. Some of those, especially Hebrews 10.20. Very important text. And 1 Peter 4.1. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Arm yourselves likewise as Christ has suffered in the flesh. These next five verses, I've quoted them. Again, it's always sarks, always in reference to Christ. We've already read the first two, Romans 1.3. Mm. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, or sarks. Romans 8, 3, as we just read as well. And look at Hebrews 2, 14. Again, the Apostle Paul. For as much then as children are partakers of flesh, or sarks, flesh and blood. Friends, every single child that was born in this world is born fallen. Adam sinned before he had children. And so every child is born fallen. And it says here, for as much as, as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, that's Christ, Notice the next few words. He also himself likewise took part of the same. The same flesh of blood that every child that's born into this world takes part of. 
Not just the blood, the flesh sucks, the carnal nature, the fallen sinful nature. And he had to because that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. This will really come to light a little bit later. He had to, go, he had to do it that way. Because only through that way could he destroy him that had the power of death. 1 John 4, 2, these are interesting. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. This is how you to test the teachers or the false teachers. And he says in, one, in 2 John 1, 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Those who teach that Jesus did not come in sarks, friends, in our fallen sinful nature, the Bible says he is a deceiver and an antichrist. That's why I was saying earlier, Adventists are teaching so many Catholic teachings these days. Having seen this so far, a person's going to think, what are you saying, Bill, that Jesus had a carnal mind? The Bible's saying it, friends, not me. The Bible's saying it, over and over again, saying it. But don't rush off and get all, you know, an anxious when you hear those words. But you've got to define what carnal means. It doesn't mean that you lust and that you're totally immoral. It doesn't mean that. It can. Of course it can mean that, but it doesn't have to mean that. We're going to see what the definition of the word means. And then you'll see how it's rightly applied to Jesus. As I've just, we've just seen five verses here. In fact, sorry, 13 altogether, you count all these. All applying to Jesus. And all telling us that Christ came in sarks. He came in that fallen sinful nature. And that, that word is, we saw twice was translated as carnal or being carnally minded. We even saw the concordance tells you that's one of the meanings for it. However... Notice the lexicon, the Greek dictionary. It can mean just simply weak, infirm, lack of strength, which we've already seen. He was touched with the feelings of our infirmities, made like unto his brethren. You know, the same susceptibilities, mental and physical. It's the word. Among other things, there it is, carnal, at the top there, carnally minded, fleshly. And of course, the flesh, the body of a man, no, no doubt. And notice C there, notice the bolded part. It means the sensuous nature of man. The animal nature, without any suggestion of depravity. Just because you're born a fallen sinful human being, it doesn't mean you're depraved, friends. That's the Catholic teaching. The animal nature with cravings which incite to sin. Notice that, incite to sin. It doesn't mean you're a sinner. And the flesh denotes mere human nature, the earthly nature of man, apart from divine influence, and therefore prone to sin and opposed to God. That's the... Biblical, strong, and lexicon definition for the word sarx, and that's why it's used so often for Jesus. And we're not devaluing him in any way. We'll see that as well. The Apostle Paul, notice, he uses this word for things that are ordained of God. Notice this, Hebrews 7.16. Talking about Christ's high priestly ministry after the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 7. And he says, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, that's Sarks there, 4561. But after the power of an endless life, you know what that, carnal, what that commandment is that Paul calls carnal? It's the commandment that God himself gave to Moses about the Levitical priesthood, about Aaron and his sons. Every priest, at least in the beginning, had to be from Levi, had to come from Aaron and therefore from Levi. Paul calls it a carnal commandment, so don't get... Again, people think, oh, Bill's saying Jesus had a carnal mind and they want to misquote or misrepresent and scare people. The Bible uses it for the commandment given by the, lip, by the very lips of God. You know, in, in other words, it was temporal, it was weak. That's why. Hebrews 9, 9 and 9, 10. Which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. These are holy things, friends. That could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Of course, talking about the old covenant sacrifices. The apostle says, which stood only in meats and drinks, or meal, the meal and drink offerings, and diverse washings, and carnal ordinances, imposed on them until the time of reformation. Again, the word here, carnal, is sarkikos. It comes from the root word sarx, and there you see the meaning underneath. Again, bodily, carnal, fleshly, un unregenerate. Notice, a, notice another meaning there, temporal. These meat and drink offerings, again, they were given by God. And they were holy offerings, friends. They represented the unblemished, perfect sacrifice of Christ. The apostle calls them carnal. 
So it's, um, it's important to understand that what we're teaching is exactly what the Bible is teaching and the spirit of prophecy. And the word that is used for Christ doesn't in any way negate or devalue him in any way. And we're going to see that too in a moment. But the Bible writers are very clear regarding that Jesus took our fallen and sinful nature. They couldn't use a stronger word. Again, inspiration. It was the order of God that Christ should take upon himself not only the form, the form and the nature of fallen man. And again, what does that mean exactly? I don't know how much plainer you can get it. He took upon him our sinful nature. That's the kind of, when he took the form and nature of man, that's the kind of nature she's talking about, our sinful nature. As children are partakers of flesh and blood, what, what nature do children partake of? Sinful nature. He also himself likewise took part of the same. He was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, starts over and over again. And notice here from the Zorro Ages, good statement this one. For 4,000 years the race had been decreasing in physical strength and mental power and in moral worth. Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. And again, notice the reason. Only thus could he rescue man from the lowest depths of his degradation. If he's going to rescue us from this, friends, he had to partake of it. He had to find a way through for us. He's touched with the feelings of it. He knows by experience. And he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He's tempted in all points like as we are. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Over and over again, Paul is admonishing us that we have one in heaven who knows our experience and he, and he can impart power to us. Only fast can he rescue man from the lowest depths of degradation. And again, as you read these things, we're not saying in any way that he was immoral or that he harboured any wrong thoughts. His powers were weakened, physically, mentally, morally. He partook of a nature where self wants to rule. Notice this, for example, in case you don't agree with that, notice this. The human will of Christ... Let's stop ready for a moment. Every one of us, every human being. Your human will. Does it want to sacrifice? Does it want to go through trials? Does it not struggle when God's leading us in a path that we know is going to be difficult? I know we're to, to rejoice, to be, we count a whether to suffer for his name, but I'm saying about that inner conflict. Of course we don't. Human will of Christ is no difference, friends. Talking about the wilderness of temptation, look what she says. The will of Christ, the human will of Christ, would not have led him to the wilderness of temptation. Notice that? Just like your will would not lead you there as well. But remember the spirit that took him there. Straight after the baptism, the Bible said the spirit took him. His human will would not have led him there. It would not have led him to fast and to be tempted of the devil. It would not have led him to endure humiliation, scorch, reproach, suffering and death. Neither does our human will, friends, want to endure any of those things because... That principle of self, it wants to protect you. Self-preservation, and, and that in and of itself is not necessarily wrong. Self-preservation can be right. We're to, of course, not be presumptuous. We're not to guard against injuring ourselves, uh, you know, wrongly or taking risks. But when God's leading you somewhere, or to believe, or to teach, or to stand, then your human will has to surrender to that. And God was leading Christ there, friends. And in fact, if he didn't go through that temptation in the wilderness, he would never have survived Gethsemane. That's another study. But nonetheless, his human nature shrank from all these things, watch this, as decidedly as ours shrinks from them. No different, friends. This is from E.J. Wagoner, Christ and His Righteousness, the year after 1888. It was published. Wagoner and Jones, they speak a lot about the human nature of Christ. Moreover, the fact that Christ took upon himself the flesh, not of a sinless being, but of sinful man, that is, that the flesh which he assumed, this is exactly what the Spirit of Prophecy in the Bible says, we've been seeing. The flesh which he assumed had all the weaknesses and sinful tendencies to which human, fallen human nature is subject. And he says he's shown by the statement that he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, one of the verses we saw earlier. So you can see where that... Wagner, you know, gave the 1888 message. Okay, and I could quote many statements from him and A.T. Jones on this point. 
speech saying exactly what Spirit of Prophecy says and of course the Bible. Uh, now again, just a clarifying statement, because like I keep saying, this doesn't mean because you have sinful tendencies that you are in some way lusting over wrong things. Notice this. You know, we're told when we do this study, we're told, we're admonished that um, it's a fruitful field. But we're also told to take thy shoes from off thy feet, for the ground on which thy standeth is holy ground. This is a study, friends, where truth and error are very, very close. Be very careful what you say and what you don't say. I could show you something from A.T. Jones, which is very, 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 very wrong, what he says. I left it out, but... Uh, and he, no one championed this truth more than him. So you've got to be careful where you go with these things. Don't go too far. In Jesus, in Christ, in him, was no guile or sinfulness. He was ever pure. She, she told us he took the sinful nature of man. Now she says in him was no sinful, because the sinfulness here is in regards to having subjected yourself to wrong things or wrong thoughts, having indulged them. And that's sinfulness. That's different from a sinful nature. They're not the same. We'll see that in a moment. In him was no guile or sinfulness. He was ever pure and undefiled. Yet he took upon him our sinful nature. I was quoting from a previous verse, but it's actually a statement that says it right here. He took upon him our sinful nature, yet he was always, always pure, undefiled, and no sinfulness was found in him. Like the Lord said, which one of you convicted me of sin? Sinful nature is not sin, friends. You don't have to change Jesus' nature. You don't need to cut him off in the rest of humanity. But sinful nature is not sin. Here's a little summary on just some of the things we've seen so far. He took upon him the, himself, that's the Lord, the form and nature of man. He took upon himself fallen, suffering human nature, degraded and defiled by sin. Christ took upon himself the flesh, not of a sinless being, but of a sinful man. He took upon him our sinful nature. He took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. His humanity identified itself with the weaknesses and necessities of fallen man. So over and over again, we see where was the, the prophets of the Bible, spirit of prophecy, or even the message, no one separated Christ from, from the same inheritance that we have. And the brethren who want to teach, oh, yes, he was fallen, yes, he was physically, etc., but not his mind, where do these things take place? Where do they take place, friends? Indulgence of appetite? That was from inspiration. Where does that take place? Presumption? Where does that take place? Worship the God of this world when you worship anything but God? When anything else becomes an idol to you? Where does that take place? It's in the mind. All these things we know, they take place in the mind. Susceptibilities, mental and physical. Where was he touched with the feelings of our infirmities, body and mind? Of course, it tells you right there in the same verse in the mind. He knows how strong are the inclinations of the natural heart, again, in the mind. And of course, he knows by experience the weakness of humanity. All these things take place in the mind. But as I keep saying, sinful nature is not sin. Sinful nature will never be sin. Sin, friends, is your choice. You need to choose. It's the will is the governing power in the life. And it's the will that governs. What, whether you go with the cravings of that nature, whether you put self first or put the will of God first. And even if you don't know the will of God, we're going to see your conscience speaking to you. That's the Spirit of God speaks to you, friends. And even if it's only that prompting there, you go with that. You can choose to go with that, exercise your will, or you can choose to do what the flesh wants to do. Another aspect of this study that's important is that man has moral powers, friends. You know, those that, when we battled this out years ago about original sin teaching, etc. And I, I, can, I can give you the quotes, but they're in other sermons anyway. But the brethren with a teaching, ministers, etc., teaching that you're born, baby is born hopeless, lost, and condemned. At birth, a baby is born hopeless, lost, and condemned. You know, there's an inspired statement that says the newborn Christian is as perfect as a newborn baby is perfect. Uh, again, I, I can do an entire, I've done an entire study just on infants. So they're not born hopeless, lost, they're certainly not born lost, they're certainly not born hopeless, and they're certainly not born condemned. Um, I've even heard reverends say that you're born a child of the devil. I mean, just amazing, some of the things that they've taught. That's what inspiration says. The nature of man is threefold. 
and the training enjoined by Solomon comprehends the right development of what? The physical, intellectual, and moral powers. We have moral powers, friends. You're not just born selfish or self-wanting to rule with a fallen nature. There are good things there as well. That's why we come to God. Christ placed enmity in man. We're endowed with these things. There are lower powers in the soul. There are the, the fallen powers. There are also higher powers. And they're both striving for mastery to, to control. You can call it the law of self or the law of self-sacrifice. We have moral powers, friends. And we need to comprehend the right development of these powers, intellectual, moral, and physical. We've got to look after our bodies, look after what we learn, what we teach, and morally especially. The great moral powers of the soul, that's what I was saying. First Corinthians 13, faith, hope, and love. Friends, we're endowed with it. Every human being is endowed with these things. Faith, hope, and love. And these things are encouraging. They're encouraging. That's why we, we hear that still small voice. That's why we hear the Spirit of Christ drawing us, calling us. That's why we hear our conscience speak to us, even when we're little, about not doing certain things. Because there's faith, hope, and love in us. And if we comprehend these things properly and, and, and utilize these things by using the will correctly, and especially the training and education we receive, we don't have to be slaves to sin and to the fallen nature. But here's a good example. Romans 2, 14 and 15. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law. Now straight off there we see the Gentiles, as far as the Jew was concerned, was anyone who was not a Jew. They were looked upon as aliens from the covenant of God. They looked upon as dogs and uncircumcised. These were very um, derogative terms. And that's how they viewed them. And it says they had not the law. In other words, the law given by God through Moses, you know, Moses' law, the Ten Commandments, moral law, etc., and all the all the blessings, etc., that God had given to Israel. But he says, the Gentiles who have not these things do by nature the things contained in the law. Now, you apply this to today, because not just then, Paul's talking about them, but today as well. A Gentile today would be anybody who's never heard the requirements of God, never heard about the Bible, and um, etc., How's God going to judge them? This verse is going to tell you about how God judges every human being. It says, remember, they tell you, what they brethren want to teach that your nature is sin, therefore you're born a sinner. Because we say, what did the baby do when, it's, when, it, when it was born? They say nothing. Of course it did nothing. It's got no reason. It's got no ability to choose anyway. And so the only way it can be born a sinner is its nature. They want to deny that, but it's the only way a baby can be born a sinner. Because everyone acknowledges it can't do anything. Plus the scripture teaches having no knowledge of good or evil, neither having done any good or evil. Therefore, inspiration is saying here, the Gentiles who have not a knowledge of God, and yet by nature, they do the things contained in the law. By nature. They show the work of the law written in their hearts. How is that? You can go right through history and you'll see this example. You know, there were missionaries who would go to certain South Sea Islands and there were headhunters there and cannibals who would kill these poor souls and cook them. And not just South Pacific Islands, Africa, different places. Among these same tribes, same peoples who had no knowledge of God, there were other natives who would protect them and risk their lives to protect them. Where did they come from? They never heard about the requirements of God, but they knew it was wrong. By nature, they do the things contained in the law. They would sacrifice and risk their own lives to help a stranger. How powerful that is. It's in Acts of the Apostles, but we're actually told it's the Spirit of God that was working through them. And notice also what it says, their conscience also bears witness. No matter how uneducated or, how, or what type of tribe you could be talking about or peoples, people know, every man knows it's wrong to lie. They know it's wrong to lie. You don't have to be taught that. Because something goes off in the mind and the conscience when a person lies. That's how they use lie detective tests. People know it's wrong to take someone's life or to take another man's wife. These are all commandments, friend, but they know. But the... The law is written in their hearts and the conscience shows, it proves it. It bears witness to the fact. And that's how God judges them. Watch this. Their thoughts, while accusing or else excusing one another. And it goes on to say, verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men. You see, I love that passage because the secrets of men, in other words, you could be up to something that no one knows, except, of course, you and God. 
And you may even be looked upon as a moral person and, uh, and a good person, etc. But there are secrets there that God knows and you know. But you know how God's going to judge you? It's not because he knows. It's not because he's going to call forth witnesses. It says your thoughts will either accuse or excuse you in the day when God judges the secrets of men. Your thoughts. How? How can God judge you with your thoughts? Because you have to have a knowledge of right from wrong. And that encapsulates every human being from every age. I don't care what tribe you came from. I don't care how, if you were into sorcery or witchcraft, witch doctors or whatever, it doesn't matter. And so it's lovely. They have a knowledge of right from wrong at whatever level. If they go with what's right, their conscience bears witness to the thing. And by nature, they do the things contained in the law. And their very thoughts will excuse them or justify them. But if they go contrary to that, God is able to judge the secrets of every individual in the wonderful wisdom of God. But what I wanted to show you here is that, because we're talking about these moral powers, faith, hope, and love, every soul is endowed with them, friends. Every soul. And if you allow them, like Jesus did, even though he took our nature, but he allowed those powers to, to grow in him. And those are the powers he followed with his will, his free will. And he was able to live the life that he lived. It doesn't mean that you have to be born hopeless and condemned, etc., or that you are born, sorry. In Isaiah 64, 6, there's a verse that says, all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. And the brethren go, there you go, see, even... The good things we do are like filthy rags to God. And they quote that text the real life. Friends, go and read that verse. Really carefully what God's talking about there. For example, still on this point about Gentiles who are not the law. For example, you know, we have bushfires here. We have floods, all sorts of natural disasters, not only here, all around the world. You know, a person, a child or a woman is, is, is taken in, 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 a, in a current, in a flood. A total stranger walks past and he jumps in, risks his life. Sometimes they die trying to save a stranger. Where'd that come from? Is that, is that a filthy rag? Where did that come from? It's these moral powers, friends. They do by nature the things contained in the Lord. They see as someone in, in trouble and need. To him to know if to do good and do it for not, to him it is sin. They'll risk their, their own life to help someone, but they don't even know it's a why I love this about human beings. And all these people want to do is, is, is demoralize us more and more and 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 contradict God's word and discourage. It's not true. When you know that you're endowed with moral powers, you look for them and you'll see them and you'll feel them when God's speaking to you and you recognize it and you follow them. Exercise your will to follow them. I'm not saying you save yourself. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying they're there and you acknowledge that they're there and you thank God that they're there. The reason we're in church, the reason we believe is because we have moral powers and finally one day our conscience said to us, what am I doing? And we started to listen to that still small voice and we started to exercise that will. We started to pray. We started to surrender and God transformed our lives because that was there. People say thing. you can talk about bushfires, you can talk about all sorts of things and you'll see total strangers. I'm not talking about Christians. I'm talking about just people in the world who knows what they believe or if they believe anything at all. And they go out of the way to help a fellow man. They're living out the law. They don't even realize it. Wonderful, wonderful thing. And that's not filthy rags. It certainly isn't. John 1, 9, that was a true light, that light of every man that cometh into the world. That's Christ working in them. They don't even realize it's Christ, but it's Christ working in them. God bless you. Now we come to Romans 8, 3. This is without a doubt for me the most important verse in all the Bible on this subject, well, especially in its context, which we'll see in a moment. What the law could not do, and that I was weak for the flesh, that's the law of God, the Ten Commandments, what it could not do, it could not, the law wants to produce righteousness and it could not produce righteousness because it was weak for the flesh, for the sarks, the fallen human nature of man continually wanted to go contrary to the law of God. So he couldn't do it. So what does God do? He sends his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, sarks, the same flesh as ours. He sends his son in the same likeness. And for sin, that means for, as a sacrifice, God condemns that sin. In the flesh. How did Jesus condemn the sin in the flesh? How did he do it? Remember the battle, greatest battle we fight is a battle against self. Friends, sin, think of it this way, this is so important now, because remember we we're answering the objection specifically. If Jesus took our sinful fallen nature, then why didn't he do the things we do? Not only he didn't do the things we do, I forgot to say earlier, we are told that Jesus hated sin with a perfect hatred. So again, remember, he was always pure and undefiled. He hated the things we do. And that's not a contradiction. We'll see in a moment. 
But this is, he still had this battle. Battle against self, friends. To him who overcometh, even as I also overcame. And sin is allowing this word to rule in your life. That's what sin is. We're going to see that. And the Ten Commandments, remember what the law could not do, that it was weak for the flesh, it was weak because of self. The Ten Commandments guard against this. They want you to put God first and your fellow man, not yourself. For example, the first commandment, just the first commandment alone, to love God, the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. If you keep that commandment, you think you're going to break the other nine? If you love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, can you covet someone's possessions? Could you commit adultery? Could you take the Lord's name in vain? Could you break his... How can you do any of the others? Impossible. You only need the first. The Lord breaks them down to make it even easier for us. But the first is enough. Even the tenth, thou shalt not covet. You know the other eight commandments are all bound up in the first and the last. In these two. For example, sin in heaven, Lucifer. He coveted Christ's position. He even says, I will exalt my throne above the throne of God, etc. He coveted God's throne. It was coveting that led to the fall of heaven. And in, in, and in coveting, what was he doing? He wasn't loving the Lord thy God with all his heart, soul, and mind, of course. So he broke the, the last, he broke the first. Eve, she coveted the fruit or the knowledge that would so-called fruit would bring, the so-called knowledge the fruit would bring. And in doing so, she broke that commandment. She also showed she did not love God with all her heart, soul, and mind because she disobeyed him. And her husband did the same. He showed that he loved his wife. He coveted his wife more than he loved God. So you can see how the first and the tenth really run through all of them. And all these sins I just mentioned, they were, and incidentally, they were unfallen beings. Lucifer, Adam, and Eve were unfallen when they sinned. Because sin is choice. It's not your nature. Jesus never sinned. He lived a perfect life in a fallen nature. And those three blew it in an unfallen nature. They put self first before the will of God. And that is sin. Every sin goes back to this, friends. And this, now remember this, this is the battle. We're going to see he had the same nature as us. We've already seen that. Now we're going to see how the battle was, especially our Satan tempted him. A person lies. What caused the lie? What caused the sin? They wanted to protect themselves. Obviously, there was some punishment if they got caught or whatever. So they lie. A person steals to please themselves. They lust again. Please, self. They fight, whatever, to protect themselves. Pride, this is a terrible one. Stubbornness, defend yourself, defend your reputation. Pharisees, they love the praises of men more than the, more than the praises of God. Avenge, is to satisfy self. You could go on and on, gluttony. You could just continue. But friends, you show, show me a sin that doesn't go back to self. Show me one. It's always a motivation. So you beat self. You keep the commandments. I don't care what nature you got. Lucifer could have done that in heaven. Adam, Eve could have done that on, in, in, in Eden. So could have Adam. They put self first. Now, Jesus has this weakness, and we're going to see it clearly now. But he never allowed this self to reign. Never once. His will was a governing power, just like yours and mine is. And he always said, not my will. Self is the weakness of fallen nature. But it is not sin until you indulge or choose. For example, man, eh? He has a fallen nature, so does man be. These two men are exactly the same, as far as the nature is concerned. Man on the left, he lacks self-control. Man B, he's a very temperate person. Man A, he drinks. Man B doesn't drink. Again, man A, he smokes. Brother under B. Of course, you could, you could put anything you want in here. But I'm just showing the, the, the differences between them, even though they have the same nature. Man A also, he, he, he drinks, he smokes, he loves worldly entertainment. The brother on the, on the right is a temperate person. He doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, he has an aversion to worldly entertainment. Can you tempt man B with alcohol? No. He's never drinking, he doesn't, he's got no, you, you can't tempt me with alcohol. <laughs> Impossible. Impossible. There's a lot of things you can't tempt me with. Impossible. In fact, I hate them. But there are things that you could certainly tempt me with. I'm ashamed, but I'm being honest. I think we could all acknowledge that the, the Bible talks about that besetting sin. What I'm, what I'm showing you is they both have a fallen nature. 
They both have the weakness of self wanting to rule. And of course, they both can be tempted in different areas because of that form of nature. They both have to battle self. This is the point I wanted to make, sorry. Both having a fallen nature, they both have to battle self. But you cannot tempt man B with alcohol or with cigarettes or with his entertainment or things like this. You can't because he has no liking to them at all. And this is an example of Christ, friends, the one on the right, in this sense. He was always pure and undefiled. He never harbored an evil thought. He hated sin with a perfect hatred. It's only when you allow self to rule that you, you then have a liking to these things, like the man on the left. There had to be a time when this man on the left had his first drink or cigarette or watched something in entertainment. And sure, there was a inherited weakness. Of course, there's no doubt about that, as with all of us. And as he indulged in these things, he started to like them. And he, they become habits. They become part of his life. He loves to do them. Now, if this man starts to follow the Lord, he starts to find out that he's got to give these things up because they're not good for his character. They're not good for him physically, etc. And he's going to have a battle. By God's grace and power and his faith, he will give them up. Some quick, some take a little time, but he will. But he's going to have the battle in this area because these are propensities of sin that he's developed. Brother B, he doesn't have a propensity of these things. In fact, he hates these things. And I'm saying this is just an example of Jesus. He hated these things. You don't have to say, oh, a sister once said to me, because we were having this discussion, and she was going, that's what I said earlier about be careful how far you go with this. She was going too far this way that she was telling me that he would look at a pretty woman with desires in his heart, you know, etc. What does ever pure and undefiled mean? You've got to be careful, friends, but when you understand this principle, you can see why he can partake of our nature and yet never harbor a wrong thought or even hate the things that we're tempted with. So then you say, well, that means he's not different. He's different in character, not in nature. You're going to see now very soon his battle was greater than ours would ever be in this area of self, much greater than ours. So great that the whole plan of salvation was at stake because Satan knew where to tempt him. So my point here is, Jesus never allowed self to rule. Therefore, he never developed a sinful propensity. In fact, he hated the things man does, but his battle was, was no different. These are my words now, a bit of a summary, of what I'm trying to say. When a temptation comes to a man, whether it be great or small, it requires a response. The one who is tempted must choose to either ignore and reject or accept and indulge the temptation. It is his will that will govern or governs. Christ, as our example, always turned away from wrong inducements. This is how character is formed. Jesus repulsed any temptation contrary to the will of God. Thus, he never possessed a propensity of sin. Inspiration clearly reveals that Jesus inherited weaknesses like the rest of us. The difference is that he never entertained a single one of them. Gethsemane is an example of this. Christ always responded, not my will. Ultimately, inherited weaknesses of humanity do not constitute sin. Rather, it is how we respond to those weaknesses, infirmities, that determines whether we sin or not. Always comes back to that, friends, the will. Not what you inherit, not um, the temptation, but what you choose to do about it. The person, when they become converted, they still have to exercise their will every, every day and even every moment to stay faithful because their nature hasn't changed. As I was saying before, we're endowed with higher nobler powers and also lower carnal powers. We can obey the lower powers, which the Bible calls it actually calls it the law of sin. Or you can obey the law of God or the law of heaven, which is um, opposite to self. One is putting self first, the other one is, putting, is, is sacrificing self. The law of heaven is called the law of self-sacrificing love. That's what it's called. And that's, how, that's the higher moral powers that are striving for our soul. For example, law of sin on the left, you put self first, of course, and when you do, and, and the law of heaven itself is sacrifice for the good of others and for God. When you put self first, I could give an example of this, but I'll, I'll let it go. You're going to suffer your, yourself ultimately. A person, like I said, drinks or smokes or other wrong habits or relationships. Putting self first can lead to broken families, uh, physical problems, etc. 
And of course, you're letting down your neighbors, your loved ones, your family. So it doesn't just impact upon you. When you live by the law of heaven, not live for self, you become a blessing to God and to others around you. Both of these laws are striving for mastery. Your will is going to govern which one is going to rule you. When you obey one, remember this point, when you obey one of these, you can't obey both at the same time. You're either selfish or unselfish. You're either sacrificing or pleasing yourself in wrong ways. Nothing wrong, nothing wrong with sitting down to a healthy meal. You know what I mean? But what I'm saying is when you obey one, you automatically reject the other, obviously. You live for God, you're rejecting the world. You live for the world, you're rejecting God. You live for God, you're a blessing to your family, to your neighbour. You live not for God, for yourself, you become a curse to the same people. The battle for fallen man, friends, is always to put self first. That's the battle. Or will you put God's law first? It was Jesus tempted to put self first. Now we're going to see it. This is Matthew 16. Jesus is looking for some encouragement here. He's telling his disciples what he's going to do, and it's for their good, for our good. He said, from that time forth, he began to show his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem. Suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes. Be killed and raised again the third day. Now he's telling them this, as I was saying, it like wouldn't hurt to get some support, but also to prepare them because we know what happened, especially with Peter, we know what happened. And he was hoping to prepare them. He told them this many times. Once he even said to them in Luke, he said to them, let this sink into your ears, but it was hidden from them. They just didn't want to hear it. Nonetheless, so he tells them about his suffering to come and his death. Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You know, I don't doubt for a moment that Peter loved Jesus with all his heart. I don't doubt it for a moment. Be careful, friends, what your loved ones tell you sometimes. And they're not converted. So when he says, this shall not be, don't even be, be this far from thee, he's saying, don't even think about this. How could you think about this? This will not happen. In other words, what Peter is saying is going to be the death knell of him and all humanity. If Jesus takes his, his advice. The Lord knew where I was coming from. He turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offence unto me. We'll come back to this in a moment. Look at that word offence. Remember, self, trying to put self first. Satan knew where to tempt Jesus. Do you think Jesus was looking forward to that trial? He says, How am I straightened? He says in another gospel, talking about the same event that was coming up. He wasn't looking forward to it, friends. That word offence, it means a stumbling block. Peter was becoming a stumbling block to him, an occasion of stumbling, an occasion to fall, a trap, a snare. Look at the last one. Any person or thing by which one is entrapped or drawn into error or sin, Satan is trying to draw him into sin. How? By not going through with it. Incidentally, don't, don't think twice. That's a sin. We're going to see that. I mean, I'm talking thousands of promises in, in the Bible before this event and even leading up to it, that Jesus gave and God gave through his prophets. It's a sin, of course. You can't make these promises, hundreds and hundreds of them, and then, and then pull out. Certainly is, and Satan knew it. And so he's saying to, Jesus is saying, you're an offence unto me. You're, you're trying to cause me to fall. I need to go through this. But look what he says. This is the important part. Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou art an offence unto me, for thou savourest not the things that be of God. Remember when I said that self will always want to preserve or protect you? Not necessarily in the wrong way, but in this case it's a wrong way. Because the things that be of God is that he goes to the cross and dies for us. That he continues to live a righteous life and takes that life to the cross. That's the things that be of God. But he's saying to Satan through Peter, you, know, you do not save the things that be, because Satan knows if that happens, he's gone. Thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. The things that be of men, the fallen nature or self wanting to prevail, is that he does not go through with it, saves himself. But the things that be of God is that he sacrifices himself. There you see the law of self and the law of self sacrificing love, warring with Christ. And Christ said it was an offense unto him because it, it cut him in here. When you get offended, friends, it's not outwardly, it's inside. It hurt. It hurt him. The devil knew. He was tempting Jesus to protect himself and let us perish. 
I'm going to see it more and more now. This next little segment, we're not much left now, but this next segment is the Zohar of Ages, especially the chapter on Gethsemane. I don't think there's a, not I think, that in my opinion, no greater book ever written after the Gospels on the life of Christ in this book. Notice in Gethsemane, notice what he's going through. Now look at these next few statements, the battle with self that he's going through here. He felt that by sin he was being separated from his father. The gulf was so broad, so black, so deep that his spirit shuddered before it. Friends, he's going through this in his humanity. He's fallen humanity. You remember the human will of Christ would not have led him to the wilderness of temptation, to suffer first, etc. No different in Gethsemane. This one's even worse. His spirit's shuddering before it. It's his humanity that's shuddering before this because self wants to, pro- wants to protect. This agony, he must not exert his divine power to escape. Incidentally, those who want to teach he's not divine on earth, he must not use his divine power to escape. As man, he must, in- he must suffer the consequences of man's sin. As man, he must endure. He has to be our example. He has to show obedience and loyalty to God at the cost of his own life. His divine power is only to be used for the good of suffering and for, for others. Now, watch how this battle against self intensified. Uh, sorry, intensifies. Terrible was the temptation to let the human race bear the consequences of its own guilt. Now, why is this such a terrible temptation for Jesus? Why? Because he has to endure as man. You can't take divinity. As man, he must endure, and self doesn't want to go through with that. So, who would? Now, why does Satan say to him, get thee behind, this shall not be unto thee? Sorry, this shall not be unto thee. Satan knew the weakness. He doesn't want us to know, but he knew exactly where to tempt the Lord. And this is what I meant by his battle was much greater against self than ours. Who of us would ever have to go through this type of temptation? To have the host of demonic powers around you, to be hunted by them, and, and around the cross and, and the darkness and the only one that really ever understood you, your father, has to hide himself from you. And you're receiving this, the, the sin and woes and guilt of, the, of, of all humanity. And, 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 and as a human being, a fallen human being who's, where, self is, where self wants to rule, you have to fight against that to go through with self-sacrificing love to save the human race. No wonder it says terrible was the temptation to let the human race bear the consequences of its own guilt. You see, self-preservation, friends, he doesn't want to suffer. And as I was saying before, he could have done this. It was, the opportunity was there. And of course he could have done it. But she doesn't tell you the consequences. The consequences are broken promises. Hundreds of them. That same night, only a few hours earlier, he said, In my father's house are many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place, I shall come again unto you and receive you, that where I am you may be also. He said that a few hours before this. Maybe not even. In John 11, he said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he be dead, he shall live again. And then he adds, believe thou this. That's not going to happen if he lets us bear the consequences of our own guilt. He's not going to come again and and, and prepare a place for us. He's not going to call the dead from the grave if he goes back. In the Old Testament, God's promises to make man more precious than fine gold. All the promises regarding 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 89, about how he, would, how he would raise Christ as the Messiah to sit upon his throne and to rule forever. That won't happen. God says, I will contend with, thee, with him that contended with thee and I will save thy children. That won't happen. I, we could just go on and on of all the broken promises because Christ here is tempted to let the human race bear the consequences of its own guilt. And again, notice. Notice how she continually is expressing the humanity. As man, he must endure. As man, he must suffer. The humanity of the Son of God trembled in that trying hour. He prayed now not for his disciples that their faith might not fail, but for his own tempted, agonized soul. The awful moment had come, that moment which was to decide the destiny of the world. The fate of humanity trembled. In, friends, these aren't cliches. This is, this is what happened. This is inspiration. This is in vision, friends. This is what she's shown by God, how serious this was. Everything was at stake. The destiny of the world, the fate of humanity hung in the balance. Christ might even now refuse to drink the cup appointed to guilty man. It was not yet too late. He might wipe the bloody sweat from his brow and leave man to perish in his iniquity. He might say, let the transgressor receive the penalty of his sin. I will go back to my father. Again, what's getting tempted here? 
the fall of nature, the self, self-preservation. I don't need to go through with this. I haven't done anything wrong. I'll let man perish in his iniquity. I'm going back to my father. Everything hung in the balance. It trembled. His humanity trembled in that trying hour. Again, going back to the consequences, what are you going to do about Enoch, Moses and Elijah? They're in heaven. He's going to go back to his father. What are you going to do about the sin problem? That's not resolved. What about the character of God? His plan of salvation has just failed. What do you do about fallen humanity and Satan and his demons? You're going to dissolve a lot of them. What are the unworld, fallen worlds? It's, you can't begin to imagine Gethsemane, friends. You'll never, ever, ever for eternity understand Gethsemane. Never understand. I believe, not even holy, only two beings will ever understand the depths of what he went through there, the Father and the Son. No one else will ever understand for eternity. And that's not even fair. It's not fair. You want people to appreciate, to understand what you go through for them. But that even, I suppose even that it could be, could be a bit of self. When he said three times, for all thee, all things are possible. You think about that. Father, for all thee, all things are possible. Take this cup from me. Even for God, the omnipotent God, not all things were possible, friends. If he's going to save man, Jesus has to die. And die would be bad enough, but it was a lot worse than just that, to suffer and die. Notice what Satan does now. He's continually tempting him. He knows where the, where the weakness is, the touch with the feelings of our infirmities, etc. He knows, and he's zeroing in more and more. He's running out of time. Look what he does now. This one is, this one's really evil. What do you do when you do something for somebody, when you've sacrificed for someone? And you don't want praise or anything, but when they don't show any appreciation at all. Now, I'm not saying it's the right way to react, but what does the, the nature tend to do? Resentment. And that's the last time I help you. They're the sort of things that have come up. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying this what comes up because you, you go out of your way, you help a brother or a sister, you help a stranger, whatever, and there's no appreciation for it. What the, watch what the Satan does now. Watch this. He's running out of time. The temptations are getting worse. He's whispering to him. Look what he's whispering to him. He's in Gethsemane. And his disciples are asleep. What was to be gained by this sacrifice? How hopeless appeared the guilt and ingratitude of men. In its hardest features, Satan pressed the situation upon the Redeemer. Look what he does. The people who claim to be above all others in temporal and spiritual advantages, that's the Jewish leaders, they've rejected you. They're seeking to destroy you. The foundation, the center and seal of the promises made to them as a peculiar people. One of your own disciples who has listened to your instruction and has been among the foremost in church activities will betray you, Judas and Peter. And one of your most zealous followers will deny you. And, we'll for, and all will forsake you. He knew what he was doing, friends. Look what it says. Christ's soul being abhorred the fort. I told you this is an incredible book. How much deeper it takes you. His whole being abhorred the fort. What's being tempted here? Those that for whom he had undertaken to save, those whom he loved so much should unite in the plots of Satan. This pierced his soul. The conflict was terrible. And they want to teach you a different nature. Eh? Look at the battle here between self and self-sacrificing love, friends, in Gethsemane. But you know what happens? We know what happened. Look at this next statement. The battle was about self, friends. Three times he uttered that prayer. Three times that humanity shrunk from the last crowning sacrifice. But watch, look at this. He's tempted to, to go back to his father. He's tempted by the ingr ingratitude of, what, what are you going to gain with this? They don't, they're trying to destroy you, they're denying you, they're betraying you. But look what his focus was. Now the history of the human race comes up before the world's redeemer. He sees the transgressors of the law, if left to themselves, must perish. He sees the helplessness of man. He sees the power of sin. The woes and lamentations of a doomed world rise before him. He beholds its impending fate and his decision is made. Look at this. He will save man at what? Any cost to himself. See what a battle was? You want to give him a different mind? 
Self or self-sacrifice, Jesus decided like he did his entire life. When everything was in the balance, he would save man at any cost to himself, even if he was to perish forever. Which, he, in fact, he, he, he felt on the cross. That's what he felt. He felt that the separation would be eternal. He could not see through the portals of the tomb. He would save man at any cost to himself. When you teach he had a different mind, you totally destroy the gospel, friends. You destroy him as our example. You destroy this amazing suffering that you'll never understand that he went through for us. His love. The woes and lamentations of a doomed world rise before him. You destroy his unflinching loyalty. And of course, most of all, you're destroying the victory over that fallen nature where Satan tempted him the most. Now, you think it couldn't get worse? You remember Gabriel was sent to strengthen him? His angel, the holiest, the strong, powerful angel in heaven is sent to Gethsemane to strengthen him to drink of the cup, to drink of it. He strengthens how he can suffer more. We're told he would have died in Gethsemane. Notice how terrible and total despair and wretchedness that Christ felt, the hopelessness that he felt. This next statement, you would never believe it. If it wasn't inspired, you would never believe this next statement. But this shows you to what depths of, as I'm saying, wretchedness and hopelessness that he, he had succumbed to. Remember, in his humanity, he must suffer. As man, he must suffer. As man, he must endure. Look at this. Look what Satan, look what Gabriel is sent to tell him. Like as I say, you, you would never believe these words. This is Gabriel speaking to Jesus in Gethsemane. He assured him that his father, he is assuring Jesus that his father, God, is greater and more powerful than Satan. Talk about temptation. Talk about being enveloped in such darkness. He had to be assured of this, that his father is more greater and more powerful than Satan. You can see the, the, the crushing weight of, of, of darkness that was upon him, that the angel had to assure him that his father, God the Father, is greater than a created fallen angel. Amazing. Anyway, the decision is made. He would not protect himself, friends. He would sacrifice everything for the good of others, and as we read before, he would save man at any cost to himself, and that's where the battle was, friends. Self or self-sacrificing, but the law of self-sacrificing love prevailed, and the law of sin was condemned. Romans 8, 3. What the law could not do and that it was weak for the flesh, it finally found someone. God sent his son in that same sinful flesh and he condemned sin in the flesh. How important is this truth? It's this truth that converted the Apostle Paul. This is, this is the truth that, that, that changed his life. Watch this now. This is a small summary on Romans 7. This is Paul and, he, and he's... He's recollecting his unconverted state as a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He thought as touching the law, he was blameless. He was so disciplined in every way, etc. But when he looked into the spiritual demands of the law, friends, he saw himself a sinner. And he was in total despair. And this is what he says. The good that I would, I do not. Straight off there, we can see, of course, everyone has a knowledge of good. They want to do good. But unfortunately, evil is what would prevail. The evil which I would not, that I do. What does he call that evil? Now, if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. The brethren that teach you born a sinner, they try to... I actually did this study on Romans. This is another study, the law of sin versus the law of spirit. I actually did that study to answer that objection. They take these words here, the sin that dwelleth in me, they say, there you go, another definition of sin. It's dwelling in us. Before we, That's not a definition of this inference. He's talking about the fallen nature here, the, the, the nature that we're still wants to govern. He's, he's going to tell you in a moment now what he calls it. He calls it a law. Look at the previous verse. The evil which I would not, that I do. What's I do mean? You've got to do something. Action of the will. I know he's hopeless. No one disagrees with that. But he's still committing sin. It's, it's not a sin until you commit it. But he calls it the sin that dwelleth in me. What's that sin that dwelleth in me? I find then a law. It's a principle inside of him. It's in every one of us. It was in Christ. We saw in Gethsemane. That when I would do good, evil is present with me. There you see that striving taking place, the good and evil. He calls it a law. Again, he says, I delight in the law of God. I like this verse. 
after the inward man. The inward man means the, the inner being, in the soul, in the conscience. He wants to do, because see, the law of God's there. The law of God there is striving with him, striving with all of us to do what is right. And he delights, he wants to do it. But this other law, you see there, the law of sin, self, self or self-sacrifice, they're both there warring, just like in Gethsemane for Jesus. Will he please self and let us perish, or will he please Father and save us? One's a blessing to others, one becomes a curse. No greater example than that one. He says, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity into what? The law of sin, which is in my members. So that sin that dwelleth in me, he's talking about, that causes him to do wrong, is the law of sin. And he's held captive to it. It's, um, it's more powerful. It's, it's not more powerful, but it is. It is to the, to the sinner. They're held captive. They can't escape it, even though he wants to do what is right. And now look at this lament. He cries out, oh, wretched man that I am. Who? This, this word here is the most important word in the, word, word in the chapter, these three letters, who? He cries out, who? Who shall deliver me? You know why this is so important? It's Pharisee speak. These men prided, and probably no one more than Saul of Tarsus, prided themselves on their, on their discipline to the law of God. You know, as I said, he called himself a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He said, as touching the law, I was blameless. The guy was killing people. Amazing. A oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body? In other words, who? Because if I can't do it, who can? Who, who do I look at? There's no one better than me in Jerusalem. Who's going to deliver me? Look what he calls it, the body of this death. He's got a death sentence and he knows it. Because now the law has really hit home. The spiritual demands of the law. Now look what happens. This man hears the gospel, friends. He finds out who it is. And he says, I thank God. He goes from a desperate, hopeless sinner who's captive to the law of sin. He cries out, who can deliver me? And he says, I thank God through who Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God. Now he's free. Now he has victory. Now he, with his mind he's serving the Lord. That word serve there, it means to be subjection to, to be in obedience to. It actually even means to be a slave to the law of God. Just like a slave does whatever the master says, so he just does whatever his master wanted, but he does it out of love and, and joy. Notice it also adds, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Notice that? They're both still there. The law of sin doesn't disappear when you become a Christian, when you get converted, when your, law, when your mind is serving the law of God. Obviously, your actions follow and your character follows. doesn't mean the flesh disappears. The flesh is still there, friends. And the flesh will always serve the law of sin. Always. Because that's the selfish part of man. Those fallen powers, as we were saying before. We're going to see that right at the end. We're almost finished anyway. At the end, we'll see that. This is the truth that converted him, friends. The reason why it's important to notice the law of sin is still there is because the brethren that teach that you're born a sinner, they say so because of your nature. Therefore, we say, well, if you're, if you're a sinner because of your nature when you're born, then you're a sinner at conversion when you're born again because your nature doesn't change. And they know they can't answer that. They never will. They try to, but they can't. It's impossible to answer that. Your nature doesn't change, and you know it. I know your character changes. I know you're transformed. Inspiration even says your nature, but in the sense that you're now following the Spirit's promptings, you're empowered, you're partaking of the divine nature. Of course, your nature changes in that sense, but you don't become unfallen. You've still got a sinful fallen, and we know this. We shouldn't even discuss it. And the Bible just tells you right there. His mind is serving the law of God, and the flesh is still there, ready to serve the law of sin. What was it that Paul heard that gave him the victory? A little bit of context. I have to read back a bit more. Watch this. It's beautiful. It's a shame they started Romans 8 there. Just forget the new chapter. Just keep reading. It's powerful. He's talking about this captivity, the things he wants, to, the good he wants to do, he does not. The evil that he doesn't, that he does. In verse 23, he says, This law, another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me to captivity, the law of sin. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he says, I thank God for Jesus Christ. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God. And then he says, for the law of the, notice this, this is what made him free. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. How did the life in Christ Jesus make him free from this law of sin that kept him in captivity and bondage with a death sentence? Now he tells you, remember he said, who, who shall deliver me? He's going to tell you now how important this truth is. For what the law could not do in that it was weak for the flesh, remember? He's talking about his flesh here. 
You can read this for your flesh, for every human being, sure. But Paul's talking this is personal testimony. What the law could not do in that it was weak from my flesh. That's why he cried out, who can deliver me? The good that I want to do, that I do not. And the evil that I will not do, that I do. What the law couldn't do through my flesh was weak from my flesh. God sending his son in the same likeness of sinful flesh, the same flesh as mine, where I had the trouble, where I had the, the captivity, where I was in prison. God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, same as mine. And for sin as a sacrifice for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. The next verse goes on to say, but the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us. He walked not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So we see that the law of sin was prevailing in the flesh, not only for Paul, for every man that's ever lived, no matter how righteous. You only have to break the law once, friends, you're a sinner. So everyone goes in that category. All of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. So the law of sin was prevailing in the flesh. That's the problem. That's, the, that's what God's got to defeat. That's what's keeping everyone in captivity. That's what's going to cause everyone to be lost and have that body of death. God sends his, own, his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That word there is sarks. The son lives a perfect life. He brings that life to the cross or, cross or for sin. And then it says, and condemns sin in the flesh. That's a legal term. God passes judgment upon the law of sin. This is so important, this part. And the law of sin is condemned. Where it says there, in verse 3, God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. The condemning the sin in the flesh there is, is to the Father, God the Father. God condemns sin in the flesh. But for God to condemn sin in the flesh, obviously the son had to as well. Obviously he had to, he had to not allow that flesh to prevail. So both are true. But the point is God passed judgment upon it. He condemned it. And this, I'll show you what I mean by that. How was the law of sin condemned? You know, if the law of sin was not condemned, there'd be no resurrection. Everyone would be lost. And if you go into your, as I said before, if you go into the grave, living in obedience to the law of sin, you're going to come out only to face the second resurrection and be destroyed eternally. But you're not going to heaven. So this law of sin had to be condemned, had to be defeated. And this is what it means by God condemning it. He passed judgment on it, friends. Here's the cross. And on the left you have sinful nature, all of us, and especially Jesus. Corruption. Sinful nature, mortality. Look what you have on the right. This is when he came out of the tomb, when Christ came out of the tomb. Corruption went into the tomb. Incorruption came out. The sinful nature went into the tomb. Holiness, a holy nature came out. A mortal, fallen nature, again, mortal nature went in. Immortality came out. Glorified humanity came out of the tomb. These things didn't come across. They didn't pass. And you might think, of course, we know that, but I'm talking to, it, to you about it in a legal sense. This is important. The Bible says God condemns sin in the flesh. It means that it's not just uh, some nice words. He passed judgment on it. Because Jesus finally got, finally someone was able to live that obedient life, entire life, the Son of God. And in doing so, not once allowing self to govern, he destroyed the law of sin by never once, by never once answering to it. God was able to pass judgment on it. So even though he went into the, into the tomb with a fallen, mortal, corrupt nature, we saw before when I'm corrupt, you know what I mean? Like the lower powers, the, the weakness and the infirmities, etc. That's not what came out of the tomb. Incorruption, holiness, immortality came out. God condemned the law of sin. And this is why the, the saints will come out of the tomb, immortal and holy and uncondemned. Because Christ, we follow him through the veil. He went before us. He, he opened the way. He, Hebrews 10, 20, very important text on this. So the law of sin was crucified, you could say. Yes, they crucified Jesus. They also crucified the law of sin, that sinful nature. It, it stayed. It remained in the tomb. It was buried in the tomb and con condemned. It didn't cross over. Christ killed it by never once yielding to it. Now we're going to finish now with Romans 7.25. Come back to this text again. This was a verse that... I never really understood, and comments that I read on it, I never really satisfied with either. And, uh, but after doing this study, it made so much sense to me. It's talking about a converted man. Of course, his mind is serving the law of God, but the, the law of sin is still there in his flesh. And, and that's, that's true, as I was saying before. It doesn't disappear. It's still there. But it's not 
It's not raining anymore. This mind is serving God's law. Remember how I said before, if you obey one, you immediately cancel out the other. That law of sin is there before you're converted. That's why the Holy Spirit convicts you of, of, of sin, righteousness and judgment. It's also there after you're converted. That's why we still have to surrender each day. As Jesus, as Paul says, I keep my body in subjection, lest that which I taught to others, I myself be cast away. So I understood this text a long time ago through an object lesson. And I'd never seen it explained well until I saw this. this I, I, God taught me this lesson. It was in 2005. We had bought the farm and we were working, cleaning it up. It was a terrible state. Rubbish everywhere and the trees, were, most of them were dying or dead. Terrible neglected state it was. In fact, we called that place Beulah. Beulah Organics, we called it, you know, the married to the Lord. And it, it did become that. Nonetheless, how did I learn this lesson? You see, I was um, pruning and, and pulling out trees with my father. And there was some particular peach trees. And they were, there was three or four in a row. And they were, I've never seen trees that were more dead in my entire life. I mean, completely dead. They'd been eaten by borers. They were hollow. And there was no effort at all to pull them out. You only had to push them with your foot. They would have fallen over. They were as dead as could be. And there I am, busily cleaning, and I'm just about to get them out of my father. He said, no, no, wait. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, wait. And he, and he got the segators and he snipped a couple of branches. And there was sap in the branches. And he said, just leave, leave them a bit long. He said, they'll give you fruit. But this was coming into spring. He said, they'll give you fruit this year. I, I, I couldn't believe it. My dad grew up on a farm. He knew more, more than I did about these things. So I thought, well, okay. Anyway, spring came and they blossomed. They flowered. And um, the little fruit started to appear and we ate fruit from those trees. And, you know, I just couldn't believe it because a dead tree, as dead as could be, brought forth fruit, beautiful fruit. And this text just came so alive to me. With my mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. The body is dead in trespasses and sin, and yet it can bring forth fruit of righteousness. And Christ took our nature, a fallen, sinful nature, and in that nature, he brought forth a, a holy life. And so the converted Christian as well, in that same sinful nature, as Christ lives out that life in us. You know, God can teach you more in one moment by his Holy Spirit than you can learn from the great men of the earth. There are so many theologians out there and so many ministers out there teaching that Jesus had a different nature to us and they write entire books on it. It's all, it's all wrong. Big Antichrist era. And God can teach it to you in nature like that. Wisdom of God. Through, through the example, an object lesson of a, of a dead tree that brings forth beautiful fruit. And so are we, friends, in this body, this mortal body. And yet we can live every day under holiness to God. Let us pray. Heavenly, loving Father, in Jesus' name, we what a amazing privilege it is when we begin our prayers and we say in Jesus' name, and it almost becomes habitual, but how, when we study what he went through, how much more value and importance it places upon that. It's a cause of Gethsemane that night, and cause of his entire life, an entire life of sacrifice, and still today bringing our prayers before thee, ministering for us. We can come before thee in his name. We thank thee, Lord, that although he was crushed with such a darkness that we will never understand, the decision was made that he would save man at any cost to himself. We thank thee that he is truly our example in every way, that we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. And that he's willing and desiring to impart that life to us. And as we studied more and more about these this beautiful life, that he is truly our example and our comforter, and that there is no trial or temptation that is not common to man, that with that same temptation you can give us a way to escape. And we know it's not common to man because Christ has endured everything and more that we will ever endure, that he was tempted at the very source of this nature that causes us to, to yield. And we pray, Lord, that we can learn lessons from these things that they can transform and change our lives, not just knowledge, but, but a knowledge that is life transforming. So we thank you for these things. We pray you'll continue to bless us as we study these more. And those who have 
in error on these things. We pray that they can see the light and be awakened by it and and also be be changed you know, as, as, as the sanctifying truth. So Lord, we thank you for these things. We pray for your presence, for the remaining of the Sabbath and always in Jesus' name. Amen.